Welcome back to the Manly Saints Project. By me, Hugh Hunter. We live in a world that struggles to understand the virtues of manliness. Our culture doesn't provide young men, or any men for that matter, with a lot of positive male role models. When I became a Catholic, I wanted to show how the saints could be manly role models for us. My weekly exploration of manly saints became the Manly Saints Project. If you enjoy my work, please consider signing up and supporting me on Substack, or click the links in the show notes to buy me a beer. Now, let's meet this week's Manly Saint. Join me today to meet a saint who managed to flummox Rome's secret police. Name, Dionysius of Alexandria, or Dionysius the Great. Life, died 264 AD. Status, saint. Feast, April 8th. Bishop Dionysius and his companions had been in hiding for four days, and by now even the bishop was surprised that they hadn't been discovered. Around them, Christians were being hunted down, and the city of Alexandria was in turmoil. But as bishop, Dionysius wasn't just being hunted by regular soldiers or anti-Christian citizens. The search for Dionysius was being orchestrated by Rome's secret police the frumentarii. If you simply translate the singular Latin word frumentarius, it means something like grain man. A freer translation would be supply officer. And indeed, once upon a time, more than a hundred years before Bishop Dionysius was in hiding and wondering when he would be discovered, the frumentarii had been the supply officers of the Roman army. They were called grain men because they were in charge of getting necessities, like grain, to soldiers posted around the Roman Empire. The supply officers traveled with the army most of the time, carrying a distinctive spear with a ceremonial head to mark their function. A supply officer needed to be an independent thinker to make sure all of the supplies made it into a war zone. And so the frumentarii learned to understand the various cultures of the empire. They learned the routes by which goods and information moved through the empire. They got good at dealing with people, good at reading people. They figured out how to get things done. It had been the emperor Trajan who had recognized the potential of his supply officers. He had forged the frumentarii into Rome's first intelligence service and secret police. The frumentarii knew everything about everyone. When necessary, they even served as the emperor's knives in the dark. The people surrounding Trajan were disturbed to realize that he suddenly knew their darkest secrets. And when Trajan died, the emperors after him relied on the frumentarii more and more. When the frumentarii made the emperor more powerful, they increased in power, too. Soon, ordinary Romans learned to hate and fear the ceremonial spear of the frumentarius. Ordinary Romans knew that, most of the time, the frumentarii moved among them anonymously, watching from the shadows or working a network of informants. Romans began to complain that the frumentarii were abusing their power, robbing or extorting ordinary people. But by now, they were too powerful a group to be easily shut down. It took four days for the frumentarii to locate Bishop Dionysius. Dionysius was not really surprised when they arrived. He had been expecting martyrdom, hoping for it, even. Although, He had expected to have a little longer as bishop. Dionysius had thought that God wanted him to lead the church in Alexandria through theological and political turbulence. He had hardly begun to lead, and now, apparently, his time was coming to an end. 
Dionysius had not been bishop in Alexandria for very long, but he was not a young bishop. He had been a very late convert to Christianity. Dionysius was born into a noble pagan family of the ancient kingdom we remember as Saba, or sometimes Sheba, a kingdom nestled in the south of the Arabian Peninsula in modern Yemen. Perhaps he was a distant descendant of the Queen of Sheba, who had visited Solomon more than a thousand years before. Because Dionysius came from a good family, he was able to get an excellent education. It turned out that he loved to read, and his interest in literature and philosophy stayed with him his whole life. He was well into middle age, a wealthy man who had been married and then widowed, when he picked up some letters that were circulating in the semi-secret network of Christianity. They were letters by a man named Paul to churches in the Roman Empire, and reading them changed Dionysius' life. Dionysius found something in the letters of St. Paul that he had not found anywhere else. He wanted more. Soon, he was in Alexandria at the School for Catechumens on his way to becoming a Christian, studying under the strange, brilliant theologian who remains controversial to this day, Origen. Dionysius became a Christian, then a priest. He was already an accomplished man, and so he naturally took a leadership role, eventually stepping into Origen's shoes as a teacher for new Christians. At first, Dionysius was a little embarrassed by all his pagan learning. He wondered whether he should stop reading pagan texts. He prayed about it. And as he did, God gave Dionysius a glimpse of what was to come, as well as what role Dionysius was going to play. It was good that Dionysius understood things from the pagan point of view. He was going to use all his learning, his leadership, and his ability to see things from other people's point of view to hold the church in Alexandria together when the world tried to shake it apart. God's plan for Dionysius's life became a little clearer in the next few years. The bishops of Alexandria had a tradition of personally selecting their successors, sometimes horrifying the people with a choice that seemed bizarre. One of the greatest bishops, the future Saint Demetrius, had been an illiterate peasant farmer when he got the message that he was about to become bishop. Now Dionysius was chosen. As the 240s came to an end, Dionysius took charge of the city. He was experienced, calm, and popular. He did not know it yet, but Christians in the Roman Empire were about to face the worst persecution of their age. First, the persecution was local. For about a year, pagan mobs struck at Christian symbols and sometimes at vulnerable Christians. Bishop Dionysius had tried to keep his flock safe and encourage them to persevere. Then, in the year 250, the Emperor Decius decided to put an end to Christianity once and for all. He decreed that everyone in the Roman Empire must make a pagan sacrifice. The only exemption was for Jews. This meant that Christians, along with members of a handful of smaller religions, faced a choice. They could give in to social pressure and make a pagan sacrifice dropping a bit of incense on an altar of the old gods. This would mean renouncing Christianity. The alternative was to hold to their principles and refuse to sacrifice. They would then face whatever punishment the Roman authorities chose to inflict. That punishment usually began with torture to convince them to sacrifice. If the torture didn't work, the Christians would be executed. The announcement caused chaos across the Roman Empire. Alexandria was in an uproar, but in a strange way, Christians were better off there because they had spent the previous year learning to operate in secrecy. Some Christians tried to stay out of sight. Some fled, which meant 
traveling southwest into the desert, taking their chances with the bandits and wild animals there. Many Christians whose faith had seemed rock-solid when it was easy to be a Christian turned out to be not so sure when their lives were on the line. They apostatized and offered a pagan sacrifice. And, in Alexandria, as all across the empire, many Christians chose the path of martyrdom. They were captured, held fast to the faith, and died. When the persecution had begun, Dionysius had heard that the secret police, the Frumentarii, were looking for him. Dionysius was happy to be martyred, but he wasn't going to make it easy for them. But what could he do to hide? The Frumentarii were experts at finding people. They were already watching all the ways out of the city, looking for him. Dionysius was good at seeing things from other people's point of view. And so Dionysius did the one thing he knew they would not expect, and stayed in a place that was so dangerous that the secret police wouldn't even bother to look there. His own house. With some amusement, he and a few companions received words of the increasingly frantic search of the frumentarius in charge. While he went round searching everywhere, the streams, the roads, and the fields where he expected me to hide or go, but he never lighted on my house. After four days of looking, it finally occurred to the frumentarii that maybe the reason they could not find the bishop in hiding was that he wasn't hiding at all. On the evening of the fourth day, the secret police finally went to check on the house, and there was Dionysius waiting for them. Dionysius wasn't sorry to be found. He had bought the Christians of Alexandria four extra days, in which the secret police had been trying to find him instead of them. Now, all Dionysius wanted was to be a martyr along with so many of his flock. He was taken away by the soldiers and locked up with his companions, with armed guards posted at the door. Perhaps the frumentarius who arrested Bishop Dionysius noticed that one of his companions, Timotheus, was out on some errand. Oh well, how much damage could one missing Christian do? As it happened, Timotheus had arrived back at the house of the bishop shortly after the raid. When he saw that the bishop had finally been found, Timotheus got scared. He ran away, pounding through the streets so fast that he plowed into a group of people who were out in the street for a celebration. The people celebrating were farmers. They were in town to celebrate a wedding, and they were celebrating with a traditional drinking bout that started in the day and would last till dawn. By now, they were extremely drunk, and when Timotheus apologized for running into them and explained that the popular bishop of the city had been arrested, the farmers began to say that something should be done about it. It was dark, and the drink was making them bold, and the frumentari had pushed them all around one time too many. In the middle of the night, the soldiers who were guarding the bishop and his companions looked up and realized they were being charged by a mob. In the dark of the night, they had no idea who these people were. In their nervousness, the soldiers jumped to conclusions. This must be some bloodthirsty bandit clan. Maybe these bandits assumed that an armed guard meant that the soldiers were guarding money or treasure rather than prisoners. The soldiers weren't going to die to protect a bunch of Christians. They ran. And so it was that Dionysius, who had prepared himself mentally for martyrdom, was woken up by a bunch of drunken, happy farmers who put him on a donkey and bustled him and his companions out of the city. Dionysius had missed his chance at martyrdom. He would glumly described the situation in Alexandria in a letter. Men and women, young and old, soldiers and civilians, every class and age 
some by the scourge and fire and some by the sword, have conquered in the fight and carried off their crowns. While with some, even a very long period did not prove sufficient to show them acceptable to the Lord as martyrs. As, in fact, seems to be the case even now with me. Wherefore, I have been put off until a time which he himself knows to be the right one. And now, I, with Gaius and Peter only, deprived of the company of the other brethren, am shut in a desolate and dreary part of Libya, three days' journey from Paratonium. God had other plans for Dionysius. Soon enough, on the other side of the Mediterranean, the Emperor Decius was cut down by the Goths, who were just beginning their slow invasion of the Roman Empire. The persecutions ended, and Dionysius returned to the city to try to repair the Christian community there. The big question for the church all over the empire was what to do with those who had sacrificed. Those who had sacrificed to pagan idols under pressure had left the church. Could they repent and come back? Many Christians thought that the answer was no. Christians who had held out were understandably angry at those who had given in. Their point of view solidified around novation, a former philosopher of the Stoic school. Christians who thought that the answer was yes, that apostasy could be forgiven, and those who sacrificed could return to the church, took their lead from the bishop of Carthage, the future St. Cyprian. When Cyprian's view prevailed, Novation was so angry that he split away from the church. Dionysius was with Cyprian. But while the brilliant Cyprian made his case in sophisticated theological terms, Dionysius put things simply. Jesus had presented himself as the good shepherd. When a sheep was lost, Jesus, the good shepherd, went and searched for it, doing whatever it took to find it and bring it back to the flock. We're in the flock, Dionysius pointed out. Did you really want to be the sheep in the flock who says, No, thank you, Mr. Shepherd, we've decided to disown that lost sheep, and we don't want it back. Let us, then, not repel those who return, but gladly welcome them. As the church was grappling with this issue, persecution broke out again, this time under the Emperor Valerian. St. Cyprian was martyred. But in Alexandria, the Roman prefect, perhaps remembering the bloodthirsty bandits who had come out of nowhere to save Dionysius the last time, decided to send the bishop into exile in the suburbs of Alexandria, with strict orders not to keep in touch with the church in the city. Dionysius ignored the orders, and things went on much as they had. Off in the east, the Emperor Valerian fought the Persian king of kings, Shapur I, and lost. Valerian was the first emperor to be captured alive by an enemy, and some said that Shapur made Valerian serve as his stool to help him get on and off his horse. At any rate, the persecutions came to an end, again. But that did not mean that things would slow down for Dionysius. For the next twelve years, things continued to go wrong, and Dionysius continued to take charge and help. There would be a famine. After the famine, a plague. Dionysius would spend his time trying to contain heresy after heresy. Some so garbled and weird that he would briefly come under suspicion of heresy himself for his attempt to find a common language to explain to the heretics why they were wrong. He would also go to war with the Epicurean philosophy, which some Roman sophisticates found comfortable, because Epicurus taught that there was no afterlife, and so no judgment. Dionysius pointed out a problem with Epicurus's view of the gods, and kept unraveling the philosophy to show that in reality, 
it offered no comfort at all. Rome was juddering through the period we remember as the crisis of the third century. The church suffered. But in Alexandria, the manly saint who had come to be called Saint Dionysius the Great led his people through the chaos. One year, he wrote to the church as the great feast of Easter approached. He reminded his people that times had not been good. The Christians of Alexandria had no illusions about how hard it could be to take up one's cross and follow Christ. But still, they were keeping the feast. First of all, they drove us into exile, and we kept the feast then too, by ourselves, persecuted and harried to death by all. Even in exile, Dionysius reminded them, there was Easter. And no matter what the Romans had done next, the great feast was still kept. In the city, outside the city, out in the desert, fleeing on ships, locked up in prison, thrown out of their homes. Year after year, the scattered body of Christ had kept the feast. Every place where each particular affliction befell us became the scene of our festal assembly, open country, desert, ship, inn, or prison. And our perfect martyrs spent the brightest of all feasts being entertained in heaven above. (laughs) 